And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from Wendigo Workshop, eh, the the creator and lead designer of the upcoming Arkellan Chronicles RPG, the one and only Jonathan Sevigny. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. Doing good. That's good. That is good. That is good to hear. Um. It, it's a bit of a tradition around here, aside from the drinking, of course, to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Um, yeah, uh, I started playing, uh, I think, ten, yeah, ten years ago. Uh, the first game I played was Dungeons and Dragon 3.5 edition. Um, I was working in uh, at a Burger King, <laughs> um, and I had a friend there that played, but uh, I wasn't really a part of the game yet. And eventually, he came to me and said, "Oh, do you want to play?" And I said, "Okay, of course." And this is basically how I started. Uh, I think my first character was a cat folk druid if I remember correctly. <laughs> and then I switched to Pathfinder 1st uh, Edition, mm -hmm. and then I continued exploring other game systems and other games around. Um, and from then, I, I just continued playing because I like it, and it's fun to play other characters and different kind of characters, too. Which uh, I, can I can certainly get that. Um... Now, go, going fr going from that, um, what's I have I have my theories as to some of the inspirations for Arkellan, but what was the spark? What was the spark in regards to trying to in regards to trying to throw your hat in to make your own game? Um, well, we were playing. Uh, I was with a group of friends, which is which are also the other people that uh, joined me with in the team that we have today. Um, we were playing, I think at the time it was, uh, it was Pathfinder 1st Edition, I think, and, uh, D&D 4, for some reason, <laughs> but, um... No need to, no need to be ashamed <laughs> of playing D&D 4, no, I, no. I, no, no, have I have defended D&D 4 set several times over the years. No, no, honestly, I think that, I say that because it, it's kind of a joke with us uh, about the Indy 4, because um, honestly, I think there's a lot of interesting things that came with fifth, uh, that came with 4th edition that would probably, that, that probably influenced a lot of things that came with the 5th edition of D&D, so I don't think it's a bad edition, I just think that in a certain way it plays very differently from the other games uh, that are in the D&D &D, uh, line of product. But it, it's not a game that I despise completely. It's just uh, maybe an edition that I enjoyed a bit less because it was so different, but at the same time I liked it because there was other things that I enjoyed mm -hmm. about it. And the... Now, when it comes to the setting of our of our Kellen, was it a case of the, this was the setting that you were that you were running a um, lengthy camp lengthy campaign and up until up until that point and just adapted it into um, an RPG, or was it a case where you where you wanted to set you wanted to set up a game and thus you created the setting of our of our Kellen? Um, it was not the setting that we were playing in, actually. Uh, when we started developing the game, we were going through um, Rise of the Room Lords for Pathfinder First Edition, mm -hmm. um, and we were just like having fun and stuff like that with this uh, adventure. But eventually, we started discussing a bit about uh, the stuff we were creating for First Edition uh, because there were some players that wanted to play things that were not in the books. So we started designing a little bit of uh, 
custom like classes and items a lot of uh, what people do when they start uh, wanting to make a, a custom rpg too uh, so we started to make little classes little uh, items here and there and eventually um we said we're creating so much things that uh, combined together maybe we could create like something more than just content for games that already exist so we started uh, thinking about what we wanted as a game uh, and what kind of setting we wanted and um it first started with a very D setting with like um the high fantasy thing and developing more we said but what if it was more uh, like a fantasy world that evolved into a more modern world? And we kind of liked that idea, so we started exploring what it would look like and how it would be. And then we started like creating what we wanted from for rules, for uh, playable characters and, st- and stuff like that. And then uh, it continued on. Mm-hmm. Now... One now, um, one of the one of the things that I that I very that I very much noticed in re, in regards to certain regards to certain aspects with character creation within um, Arkelon Chronicles is the is um the what is the way think the way things like skills are used and the and the way um. The way certain the way certain advancements are set up in the pl- in the uh, playtest, and I'm cur- I am a bit curious if um, Star Wars Saga Edition was something you guys drew influence from at one point or another. Um, actually, it's not a game we drew uh, a lot of influence from, uh, because it's not a game that we know that much. Honestly, I. Uh, went through it a little bit uh, when I was like making a little bit of research to how we wanted to set up the game. Uh, but it's not a game that we took a lot of inspiration from uh, that much. Maybe a little thing uh, here and there that we thought, oh, okay, that's interesting, and we noted it. Um, but I think that the really major inspiration that we uh, we took was uh, very much the D&D and Pathfinder, uh, since we were playing a lot of these. Mm-hmm. And um, also some video games that we pretty much like, uh, like Mass Effect and uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, something that we took a lot of inspiration from, too, uh, right. for designing like the, the universe and the art style and... I could I could definitely see the war I could definitely see the Warcraft inspirations given the um, logo designs that you have for the di- for the different classes. Um, and at the at the very least, since, since you brought up Mass Effect, at the very least, a campaign in um the, in this in um this setting will have a proper ending. <laughs> Probably, um, yeah. But I, I mean, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the DM. But even, yes, <laughs> even after even after a decade, I'm still throwing shade. <laughs> um, yeah, you can, you can. <laughs> but when it comes, one th- one thing that I know that I noticed when it came to the when it came to the races, because if would it be would it be accurate of me to say that within e- within each of the r- within each of the races you have um you have a you have kind of sub you have kind of subtypes or in this case um heritages yes we uh created like a uh, sort of races that are more global things that are um but we separated them in heritages because we also wanted to give the opportunity to the to players to uh, have like these different not ethnicities but like cultures that come within one race because most uh, I mean just just us here on Earth we have like humans but each each um, countries have different uh, cultures different skins uh, and different 
different everything actually so we wanted to go in the direction where like each race had a global name but uh, there were different ethnicities that also have two players mm -hmm. and like different kind of stories that they can play I got I got gotcha. you now it's very it's very clear from the visual design and and some of the mechanical setups that you're going for a um sci fan a sci fantasy approach and whenever I've often just I've often described um the creation of a fantasy or an SF setting as a series of questions um now when it com and that brings me to the fact that a term like science fantasy can still have a lot of um a lot of variants for in for instance dune and star wars very much ca very much count as sci fantasy i or space opera and yet they and yet the storytelling with within both of those stories has very little in common um now given the fact that you've said that y that the approach that you're di you're taking is more of a fantasy setting that um ju that jumped ahead in technology would it be fair of me to say that a lot of the adventuring is going to be on planet we're not dealing with um space or low orbit stuff just yet that is going to take place um, actually in the main book or the base book will happen on one place and one mm -hmm. planet. I uh, really wanted to concentrate on creating like one very solid setting and later on explore uh, the mechanics for uh, doing adventures uh, a la Star Wars or Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, mostly because um, it takes a lot of place in a book <laughs> to expand on rules like that. And um, it's sure that if we take a lot of place in a book for that, we have to cut somewhere else. And since we already have a, a big book with a lot of illustration, we wanted to maybe put it in something uh, that is more of additional content uh, because uh, it's a fantasy that people have. Uh, but we wanted really to keep it maybe as additional content to really uh, put more emphasis on the base world that uh, the people live on. Mm -hmm. Now, bef now bef before I before I get into into think into things like classes, one of the things I wanted to br wanted to bring up that I find very interesting, especially given the inspirations that you mentioned is how you handle skills cuz give the approach the, the approach that I'm seeing is not is not too far removed from the skill training motif that was in um Star Wars Saga edition and um D&D 4th edition where where skills are where you don't have a set of skill points at each at each level but instead a instead of skill was that was that done as a response to the skip to the skill points approach that Pathfinder has or how else did it come about um, it mostly came about because we wanted uh, at first, when we started designing uh, the skills, it, it started as a point. Or classes or.
other. Yeah, so um, we uh, we started developing the skill sets uh, with a point by system that looks uh, that is very similar to Pathfinder, mm -hmm. uh, the first edition. Um, but we eventually scrapped it because we thought that it was um, blocking a lot of possibilities for players to really choose the skills that they want their characters to have. Uh, because in first edition of Pathfinder, when we started working on the game, like some classes could not pick up some kind of lore skills, or they could not pick up some uh, craft skills or some uh, whatever skills. Uh, so this is something we didn't really liked. Uh, because if if you want to build a character with magic items, but they are like just a, a warrior or a fighter. Uh, you shouldn't have to multi-class to pick up like one skill. So we eventually went with just leaving the choice to the player and removing the skills, uh, the skill points. So it just like, um, it, it's easier for people to say, okay, so I have the skills and, and it gives me that much point. And when I level up, it's going to follow uh, my training and my uh expertise more than just epic points and separate them now since i since i kind of dipped into it i'll go i'll go into um i'll go into classes because now before i before i i do want to kind of go go into each and how and and um how they'd be how they'd be similar or different from from, from certain classes that you that may have been your inspiration in um say pathfinder but before I do that, I want I wanted to address the um, concept of paths that's seen in the playtest document. Um, now, obvious, obviously, it's obviously it's pretty clear to me that that, that those the paths that were shown were just were just a demonstration of how that sets how that is set up. But is it is it the case where each cl where each class will have multiple paths that they can take? Yes, the, uh, each uh, each class have different paths that they can take, uh, but they can if they want uh, pick one class and take multiple paths when leveling. That never. on the table. Started using uh, spell slots mm -hmm. 
Um, and we um, we finally switched to a, a like resource type of things, uh, mostly because it gave it gave uh, more versatilities uh, to the spellcaster classes because uh, you could select some spells. You had like a list that you can cast your your spell from. Uh, but as a player and as a character, you don't uh, have to uh, select your spells in the morning and when you cast like this spell once it disappears forever until you reach another day um, so it, it gives a little bit more of versatility and freedom to cast the spell that you need at the moment you need it outside instead of just having like okay so I have I don't know, like in Pathfinder, I have like Magic Missile and it's my uh, two, one of my two first level spell that I can cast and I cast it now and then I cannot use it anymore. Um, but when I need it, I don't have it. Uh, so we try to approach it in a different way to give more freedom and more versatility to casters. Now, with with that kind of thing in mind, I'd like, I'd like to... I'd like to um go through I'd like to go through the list of playable ca classes that you've had that you've had and this will be kind of a lightning round of sorts and what and what classes what classes they might be similar to in in other works and what cl and um how would they be di how would they be different from what's typically expected from its uh, namesake I'll start right. with, I'll start with arcane warrior which I look at arcane warrior and I think gish is that fairly accurate? Yeah, it could be. It's something that when we uh, checked around a lot of uh, the fantasies that people had, um, like overall, like in forums and in other places, um, the fantasy that a lot of people have, there's Spellblade from 4th edition and all these kind of characters that could get, that could use magic but also use uh, melee or ranged combat. Uh, so it's a thing that we wa really wanted to uh, try to find a way to integrate because a lot of people seem to like these kind of uh, character archetypes, like the Magus uh, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, would the next, the next one is Arcanist, and would Arcanist be... Um be analogous to a traditional wizard? I think that it would be the closest uh, to the traditional wizard uh, but uh, the thing in uh, the this world is that uh, Arcanist can only control one type of magic uh, one type of elemental magic uh, they cannot use like fireballs or lightning strikes or stuff like that so they are really concentrated on the arcane magic um and some kind of infernal magic with the demon, uh, demonologist path, where they can summon demons and throw hell fireball and burn people uh, with uh, the power of the demons. But other, other than that, it's really like an arcane caster that use arcane magic uh, specifically. They can heal also with the thaumaturge. They can control other people with their magic, uh, like puppets and stuff like that. So it, it's it could be akin to a, a traditional wizard, but it's uh, I think it it's a little bit more specialized, I guess, than a traditional wizard. Um, now I'm guess now, especially with its namesake, the next one, Berserker, I'd, I'm guessing would be analogous to barbarian classes. Yes, it's analogous to the barbarian classes. We uh, went to a development mechanic where um, we inspired ourselves a bit from the warriors in World of Warcraft. In this sense, we uh, give them some sort of points that they could use so they can uh, have stronger melee attacks and things in that way. So... Uh, they have a rage, but it, it's not really a rage because we try to expand it to other emotions too. 
uh, because it's not only anger that can make people crazy. <laughs> so we tried to uh, delve into other emotions that we could base your berserker on. Uh, we went to a direction that since demons are quite present in this uh, setting, we have a line of them that are corrupted a bit by demons, so they can shape shape into big demons and use fire from hell to burn people or use technological weapons uh, that they can craft themselves and go more into a urban type vibe mm. uh, outside of instead of like the tribal really uh, kind of, of things. All right. Now, the next one is Crusader, which with a name like that, I, imme I immediately think um, Paladin. Would that, yeah, would that be accurate? And does that does that also and um paladins have paladins in various editions of D and D and in Pathfinder have had a little bit of spell casting ab ability. And is that the case with the Crusader, or not really? Um, the Crusader. He is uh, really close uh, to a paladin, so they have a little bit of divine casting uh, integrated. Uh, what we went with the Crusader is really uh, use inspiration from uh, like some medias that use like, the Inquisitor and really uh, this kind of things. And we also went to a direction where there was one type of Crusader, the Dragon Knight which is using more uh, spiritual magic, which is more of a crusader of, of nature that use the power of the elements to uh, power himself. So instead of gaining divine spells, they have spiritual spells and they can take the form of dragons and, and breed fire or other things, depending on what they choose as a patron. Yeah. And now, Druid is obviously analogous to Druid, but the the um druid class as it's developed over the years can veer off in many different ways whether it, whether it be nature magic whether it be um ri whether it be more ritualistic ends or um or shape or shape shifting and that and then bring in um animal companions um how d how does the, how does the ar archetype of the druid um, get handled in Arkelon? Um, so since it's a more modern setting, um, we try to bring druids in a way where um, they could easily be uh, put into an urban kind of setting and still be uh, playable and, and viable. Uh, so, of course, they can control plants, like most druids, but we also went to a direction where they can control insects, so they can uh, speak to animals, they can uh, try to... Um, there are some of the choices in the, the class that allows you to have, like, your... Um, like you, when you're in a city or when you're in a dungeon, uh, the little verbins that are there can uh, warn you from danger, so you cannot be uh, surprised by ambush, or you can ask them to go fetch information into a city or in a camp or or stuff like that. Um, we we also wanted to bring a little modern uh, feel to them, so. Uh, for now, the illustration that we have about druids, uh, it's more like people that like nature or are like researcher. Uh, they find uh, they try to study like beasts or they join circle of druids to learn about nature and how to save nature. Mm -hmm. oh. Now, next with the hunter. Um... Obviously, obviously, I could um, draw comparisons between the Pathfinder Ranger, but would uh, would it be fair to say that this leans more towards the Pathfinder style Ranger or the WoW style um, Hunter? I think it could be a mix of both, in a way, um, because we have like uh, we try to concentrate a, a part of the class to be really like the beast master kind of character like uh, because people like 
uh, to have like these little pets that follow them around and attack people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we really try to make like one archetype that really concentrate of, uh, on having beasts, having creatures, control beasts, and like have their little uh, creature RV that follows them. Uh, but we also try to go into a direction where you like this lone ranger that is uh, hidden in the wood and shooting people from very far away. Um, and also go into like the uh, ranger style uh, with some animal aspects that you can uh, slightly alter yourself into um, creatures that you've encountered before. But it's not at the point where you can shape shift into creature. But uh, you can take some aspect from like uh, example bear, so it gives you more uh, resistance. Or you go into uh, like other types of animal that give you more. Uh, carrying capacity or speed or a different kind of, of abilities. Mm-hmm. Now, the next one, of course, is going to be near and dear to me because, well, it's my gimmick. <laughs> that, <laughs> that being that being the monk, because let's be honest, nobody nobody's playing a monk so that they can so that they can so that they can write down scrolls. They're playing the monk because they because they want to punch people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. And. Give, um, given the given the approach that th- that um you that you have when it comes to the action economy, which we'll get into later, um, how, where does the does the would the monk play very would the monk in Arkellen play very similar to the monk in Pathfinder, especially with things like flurry of blows? Um, we have created some kind of um. Abilities for monks that are called stances, which are similar to the stances used in uh, Kung Fu and other uh, type of martial art. Uh, we try to get inspiration from these kind of combat styles. So we have like the crane style or the dragon style or the tiger styles and stuff like that. Uh, that gives all different kind of uh, small bonuses to the the character depending on like which style they adopt. Um, we try to make a mechanic that is similar to the uh, flurry of blow because this is a thing that people really enjoy about the monk, like being able to uh, hit people a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, with the dragon style, uh, which is the the style that monks gain at first level, uh, if you hit an attack. Uh, if your first attack is a successful hit, you gain an automatic uh, bonus attack that does not cost any points of uh, stamina, so you can like roll another attack. Uh, so technically, at, at first level, you can attack like three times uh, if if your attack hits, and then at later level, you can like uh, you always increase like one attack. Uh, so if you have more stamina points, you can do more attacks. Um, and it also gives some bonus to uh, the will and other kind of uh, resistance because they are able to focus themselves a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, the other, the other major aspect that's often seen with the monk is is having having some sort of quasi magical ability in the form of key, whether that be a pool of key points in um, fifth edition or in Pathfinder Unchained. Or um, or just a, or just a sp- just a um spell like a just like a spell like effect with some of the higher tier class features like the fa- like having um having the monks unarmed attacks count as magical. Yeah, we uh we used a uh we gave monks uh key points uh when we made some research uh about monks uh like in real life. Uh, it's uh, something that is used a lot with uh, with the the design of these uh, these people. Like they they do a lot of key like regeneration or key um, like they they concentrate their body mm-hmm. to not take damage and things like that. So uh, we thought it was an important feature to give them, uh, but it doesn't really work as the key points in Pathfinder or. Um, D and D mostly when a combat starts, uh, the monk has no points, and when he attacks, he regenerates some points, and he can use them to make 
special attacks or increase their attack or heal more depending on which path uh, the player chooses. Would it be accurate to say that it functions more in the, more in the style of momentum? Yeah, we, we can say that. Um, now, the outlaw... I'm get. I'm guessing that's going to be analogous to the ro to the rogue. Um, we can say that it's really close to a rogue. Yes. Um, does would that in, would that include some equivalent of sneak attack? Mm, something similar. Yes, uh, that we included to them um, because we wanted to still keep uh, to like have something. Uh, different, but also that still feels uh, like classic RPGs. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really wanted to try to keep some aspects that these classes had, uh, but try to approach them maybe in a way that are uh, different a bit, or uh, it includes some uh, abilities that maybe those classes usually don't have, or uh, expand on them on their lore and how they are treated in this world maybe in a different uh, in a different way yeah now next is uh next is the performer which um based on its description i would guess it's analogous to a bard and bards tend bards tend to get a unfortunate bad rap um large, largely because of the fact that it's tr that um there was a lot of jack of all tradesness with bards in in plenty of fantasy games, but they're but they're not really focusing on on anything specific. Although they can be good um, diplomacy guys, um, diplomancers as they're nicknamed. Um, is a, is that a similar case with performers? And would they be getting some limited spell casting the way bards do? Um, we approach bards because uh, I have to to do a side note on that. Bards also are a class that I really despise and I don't like uh, because I think that in some in some games they are approached in a way that made them extremely boring to play uh, because they have not really they don't really have much spells that are interesting, but they also don't really have much anything that. Uh, give them this little edge or this little cool factor I suppose because they are so good at everything that they are not really they don't have that much of an impact I mean maybe it's the game I played and maybe the, the, it's the people that played Bard in in the games I played that played them badly and that's why they, they have a bad rep in, in my I, book I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case because I can speak from experience. You are not an isolated case. I end up hearing that a I end up hearing that a lot with bards and the 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 um ish the the issue I see with why people with why people give bards such a bad rap, bad rap the um concept notwithstanding is the is the fact that you're dealing with a jack of all trades class in. A, in a game where class design has everyone geared tailor geared towards a specific role or a specific um, motif or what have you and the bar, the bar doesn't really ha doesn't really have that comparatively speaking um, oddly enough um, fourth edition um, attempted to address this and I think it addressed it a lot in a far more interesting way than, say, Pathfinder or um, Dungeons and Dragons Third Edition did. Yeah, it, it, as I said, it's a class that I don't like, and I wasn't even sure that I wanted to put it uh, in the game first. Uh, but after speaking with other people from the team and other people outside of the team, it's a class that is very popular. And that people like a lot for reasons. Uh, so since, since it was a class that people liked a lot, we gave ourselves some kind of challenge to make it different from what it is in other games, make it interesting and and special on its own. Um, so we to create a bar, the very first thing that inspired us was. Uh, Sona from League of Legends. 
uh, it's like the first thing that that we thought about when we started to design game the the bards or the the performers. We said ourselves, but what if you had like your music instrument mm -hmm. and that you had to actually play your music instrument to create things uh, like some effects with your magic instrument that was stronger than what you were doing. Um, so we like created this system of notes and uh, performance. So when you play a, a bard in combat, you start by playing notes in your instrument, which does some effect. And after three notes, you can play a very stronger, uh, a stronger effect of uh, your choice, depending on what uh, choice you make when you create your character. So you can like heal a lot or make a lot of damage or protect your allies with a shield or give them a boost of damage um, and, and things like that. So we really try to go with a more maybe interactive way of playing your bard. Like you have to actually play notes before you do your things that are better and stronger. Uh, so they don't really have access to spells per se. Uh, they more have like a magic instrument that does stuff uh, for them. Like the, the instrument is uh, the source of their magic. Um, and we have the dancer that is playing a little bit like the musician, but is using uh, spirit magic. So they use dance move to uh, invoke elements and create effect with that with that and we have the trickster in which case it's more of a magician like the the real type of magician like a, a bunny in a hat like yeah. they create things they make illusions they control people uh they trick you they trick your perception um so really try to approach like these as artists uh more than just people that can do everything mm -hmm. Uh, we try to approach them more in a way that they are they are artists and they have different specialization of artistry that brings uh, either magic or other type of trickery. Um, now next is priest. Now the the um pa the pathfinder, much like the D and D priest, is is notable for. Not not just divine casting, but also um, effects like turning, um, specifically turning undead, as well as the fa as well as getting certain specific spells based on their domain. How similar or different would the priest be versus the um, Pathfinder cleric, or the or the um, priest in World of Warcraft in this in, in this instance? Um. I say that depending on which god you pick, um, it's not really domain based. Uh, it's more like a god or belief based thing. So whenever you pick a god, you have like one spell that is exclusive to your character that no no other character has, unless you have another priest that has exactly the same god than you. Um, and each path give very different spells. Um, for example, like the Exorcist, it's more of a dark priest kind of thing. Uh, it's not necessarily evil, but uh, they can like summon spirits or uh, extract spirits from people's body, um, like use demons and things like that because they are uh, they have like this connection with the occult part mm -hmm. of the world. But there are also like the healer class uh, that is way more uh, a classic uh, cleric vibe. Uh, we try to give them interesting spells and different spells than cure light wounds because uh, this is another thing that we don't really like uh, about uh, role playing games in general is that uh, each spellcasters they all have the same spells to do the same thing, and this is something that we really wanted. You give each classes is their own. Um, when you pick a path, you have like your own spells that are different from another path that could do the same thing, uh, the same thing in you. Um, and we also have like this purifier thing that it's more uh, the like zealous uh, warrior of fate that use spells to uh, like the inquisitor, but more spellcaster, so they use. Uh, divine magic to like turn demons and 
destroy evil or good because people can be evil in this world too so um, now the shaman in its description the shaman is referred to wield as wielding the power of the elements given that would it be would would it be would it be more accurate to say that they ha that they are more analogous to the sorcerer as opposed to the wizard mm. Yeah, they could be more akin to a sorcerer, maybe. Uh, but I think that if we have to make a, a real comparison, uh, I think it would be more akin to the shaman in World of Warcraft than it is uh, something in Pathfinder. Um, maybe the, like, I don't know, kineticist, maybe, or something like that, but but I I get the, I get the feeling that the sh the um the spell list that the shaman has is ve is very straightforward. They either they either aid or they or they harm. Um, yeah, it's pretty like uh, depending on which elements you choose, mm -hmm. uh, you have like different approach to your character that is that does different thing. But the base spell list. I use a lot of uh, straightforward spells that are like lightning bolt or ice shards or ice armor that gives you like bonus armor or stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty like depending on the elements that you choose, uh, you go into different branching and different specialization. Now, our last is the warrior and. The warrior is another one of the the warrior, or in this case, the fighter is one of those classes that has a bit of um, baggage because you've got several generations of gamers who treated who treated it as the standard class, as ba as Babby's first class, or the class for people who don't want to do a whole lot of thinking. Um, would give well, and obviously this isn't exactly the case with the. World of Warcraft um, warrior, would it be fair to say that you lean more towards the latter than the former? You're not doing the feater, as it as it's been nicknamed. Mm, we uh, we have one uh, path of warrior that we went uh, more into an army man kind of route, uh, like the soldier, which is like really the most straightforward. Uh, type of character, but we still try to in invest some thinking in it. Uh, so we have like we have them uh, gain a little bit of bonus talents to make it more versatile and special uh, when you play it. But mm -hmm. um, we also try to give them some abilities uh, like field medic that allows them to heal people uh, or other abilities that allow him to look at the battlefield and say, "Oh yeah, this." enemy is uh, in bad shape so attack him and give bonus a little bit like the warlord in fourth edition it's a class that i really 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 enjoyed and i think that has a really interesting mechanic so uh we wanted to not copy that that feeling but uh have a class of fighter that does things uh other than just smashing things without having much abilities other than 20 different feats yeah and the um even 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 with the improvements that Pathfinder brought about, the feat system in that one had a lot of um, traps and a, and a, and of and a little bit too a little bit too much hand breaking for my taste, which is something I've something I've criticized, and I'm glad to see that the um, your equi your equivalent to feats in Arkelon is far more um, organized. Yeah, we tried to leave it organized a bit uh, so it can... Uh, with the talents, we went into a direction where we wanted uh, characters to feel useful, but we also wanted people to be able to pick any of these and still feel like their character can be useful. <laughs> Uh, because in, in Pathfinder, this is a thing that when we played a lot of it uh, that we really didn't like is the fact that when you create a character, if you don't want it to be combat-oriented, uh, you're going to feel like a second-hand 
character. And this is something that we really tried uh, to address because there are people that don't like playing combat-oriented characters, but when encounter arrives, they are useless, so they're not having fun. Yeah. Uh, now, now, when it comes to... I want to dip into um, spells a bit, because obviously through this, we've, de we've, um, we've dealt with several full casters and several half casters. Um, when it comes to how you have spells presented in the book... It, are they separated by are they separated by power source, or is each class getting their own specific list of spells the way say um, fifth edition handles it? Um, we divided them by power source, uh, so it's easier for people to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, so arcane magic. We have divine magic. Uh, we have. Um, nature magic and spirit magic. Uh, so, for example, the shaman. And the Dragon Knight will be using the Spirit Magic list. The Druid will be using the Nature Nature Magic. Mm -hmm. uh, Priest and Crusader will be using the like Divine and Arcane. And Arcane Warrior will be using the Arcane list of spell. What's the, what would be the thematic difference between na between Nature and Spirit Magic? Because oftentimes those oftentimes those two are combined in a lot of um, fantasy gaming. Um, nature magic uh, is more about controlling life, uh, so like summoning things, uh, summoning plants, summoning insects, speaking to animals, uh, summoning like forest of, of thorns, uh, having a little bit of elemental magic, but not that much, so a little bit of electricity here and there, a little bit of fire here and there, because it's still a, a part of nature. Um, but we try to keep them very uh, open about what they could do, because it's nature magic, so we try to integrate a different aspect of nature into it. So, uh, as I said, like plants, insects, a little bit of uh, elemental but in the spirit magic, we really went into full-on elemental things. Uh, so everything is inspired by elements. And we have some little things here and there uh, that are reminiscent of nature, uh, like speaking to animals mm -hmm. and things like that, because there are still a little bit of natural things in them. Mm -hmm. And in the magic, uh, nature magic, we also invested a lot of time into thinking about polymorph spells because uh, a part of things that in nature that is not used a lot is evolution. Uh, so we integrated a lot of polymorph spells. Uh, so creating gears, make bioluminescent parts on a creature or um, changing parts of yourself, parts of others, uh, because this is also a big part of nature. So we wanted to integrate it into their spell list. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, because of the fact that you're go that you're dealing with a fantasy setting that has more advanced tech, um, a question that I always end up bring bring up with these sort of um, science fantasy settings is the is the relationship the relationship between um, between gun between more contemporary weaponry and more fantastical weaponry, i.e. Do we have do we have a situation where where um guns end up end up out end up outstripping um other other melee and ranged weapons because I because I've seen that happen I mean that's happened plenty of times when it comes to stuff like Shadowrun. Um, from what we tested, uh, I mean the only advantages that are notable between guns and other weapons is that they have range, and that's basically the only advantage that they have um, so I mean if a person is on top of a building or or house and and shoots you with a sniper gun well you have to hide yourself because although it will deal damage that is correct for your level or for whatever uh, well it's still a ranged attack that is targeting you so it's it's still the damage but from from what we tested guns are quite equivalent to other types of melee weapon. Um, we try to give each weapon their own little ability 
also. Uh, so we tried to make weapon other than just skins uh, that your character have. So if you go with, for example, an axe that does X number of damage, it will not do the same thing as in swords uh, that does for example, 1d10 point of damage. Uh, both will do the same damage, but they will have their own different kind of uh, unique abilities uh, that would further like customize your character and make you feel like your weapon influence a little bit more how your character is played. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I found interesting when it came to the, when it came to the core mechanics is that it Unless I'm unless I'm misreading this, um, you what the a part of the core is two d twenties, one rolled by the player and one rolled by the DM. So, effectively, the effectively would would it be fair of me to say that the majority of rolls are contested between players and G and GMs? And if so, what led you guys down that particular path? Uh, yes, yeah, so the mechanics we ended up using is a comparative D20 uh, route. Like, uh, as a player, you throw your own dice and the GM throw his own dice. Um, the reason why we went into this uh, mechanic is because, especially playing a lot of Pathfinder, um, later in the game, um, you always end up with archetypes of characters that uh, are completely useless uh, if they are not optimized correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, the druid, even though he's good, uh, later in the game, his uh, hit chances are really bad compared, for example, as a, to a fighter. So even though if you even though you pick a uh, form, a beast form. Uh, you still have a lot of chances to miss enemies because there are so much AC that you can just do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a thing that was really annoying. So we tried to uh, find a way to make this gap between uh, fighting classes and uh, like fighting ca characters and maybe less optimized. I don't know how to say it otherwise, but like people that prefer to go into a more role-playing route with their characters, or like a lot of crafting skills or crafts. Um, so with the, this this kind of mechanic where the GM and the player, uh, or two players, roll their d20 uh, against each other, uh, it makes that even though a character or a creature is extremely good at something, you still have a chance other than like having a 20 uh, to do something. Uh, because if a character, if a creature is really good at, for example, dodging attacks, and you're a character that is not oriented in, in combat, um, if, it, if the creature rolls a 1, well, you can still hit it, you can still do something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the thing that uh, we really enjoy with this kind of mechanic, is that some uh, creatures or some characters feel like they can do something even though they are less uh, they are not as good as others and it also gives uh, a way that uh, when you fight creatures or when you deal with people um, you cannot really learn every creature by heart and say oh yeah this has 20 AC so if I, I pick up a 15 I will touch it automatically uh, it, it still gives like this little edge and surprise to uh, what each creature can do because if you even if you know what kind of abilities they do uh, it, it's harder to predict what they can do mm -hmm. now something i found interesting when i looked at the when i looked at the entries for weapons is the perfect strike rule um specifically a additional effect that that ends up happening when when you when you roll a natural 20 um and I found that an interest. I found that an interesting response to the whole ro natural twenty means an automatic hit um, school of school of thought that the D twenty system has. Um, was that created? It was that created directly as a response to that kind of thing to make it so um, weapons have distinctiveness between each other when when criticals happen. 
Um, yes and no. Um, it, it actually came from uh, an idea that we had because we have a friend uh, that is part of the team too that, that like, I don't know what, what's with him, but is always rolling 20s. <laughs> and um, at a point we just said, but rolling a 20 is it's exciting, it's cool, like you have a 20 on your dice and it's, it's fun. But at the same time, it does, it does nothing. Like it's it's a number on your dice, and you do like double damage, and you you hit, I guess. Uh, so it's like it was something that we uh, said. I think a twenty is exciting. So how can we make it exciting? Um, so with these perfect strike effects and bonuses and difference between weapons. Um, it makes it that when you roll a 20, it's, it's cool. Like, your character does something cool, like people catch fire or they impale a creature with their spear and it's, it looks cinematically cool. Um, so it's something that we really wanted to integrate because uh, in most games that I was a part of, rolling a 20 was really cool, but at the same time, it doesn't really do anything else than a crit. Um, so we wanted to make the distinction between a 20 and a normal critical hit, so. All right, that 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 certainly makes sense. Now, since we, since we kind of dipped into it, let's go, let's go a little bit further in when it comes to combat. And specifically, I want to ask about the stamina system that you guys have, because it's it makes for a very... When I initially saw it on the Kickstarter page... Before I read the playtest, I had thought that your stamina system was the extra effort system. When that ended up not being the case, it's the lu it's luck that ends up being the extra effort system. But with stamina, I noticed that you guys have a kind of economy of actions it, with this action point set up, as opposed to having um, sta standard move, sw swift, free, and so and so on. Wh how did that come about? And what was that um, made into response to? Um, we uh, actually a lot of people think that the stamina system is uh, the same system that Pathfinder Second Edition use uh, because they use some kind of point thing. Uh, I can, when I can see why people would say that, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, we actually started to develop this uh, the stamina system way before, like. Uh, the second edition of Pathfinder was uh, announced because uh, we thought that it was an interesting way to bring forward the economy of action and also a way to give freedom uh, to what people can do in their turn, uh, but also maybe give people the opportunity <laughs> of failing and not have it be a massive disappointment. Um, like when, uh, for example, in, in Pathfinder, you roll your dice because you're a fighter, you have one attack, and you miss. So your turn is over. Um, and it's quite disappointing. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, uh, with, the stem with, stamina with stamina points, um, it, it makes it like, for example, uh, the, the same fighter use an attack, he miss, but he didn't move, so he can attack a second time. And if he miss again, well, that, that's sad, <laughs> but it happens. Um, but at least it gives people the opportunity to attempt something else if they failed. Uh, like spellcasters, if they failed a spell, they can use another one, or they can attack, they can move, uh, they can do... Uh, in different, uh, they can do all different actions. Uh, for example, if you attack but you're damaged, you can move away, take a potion, take a healing kit, or um, uh, things like that. So, with the stamina system, we really try to bring forward some way to give freedom to people, but also have a way uh, to give the opportunity to uh, um, react to things other than just making attack of opportunities. Uh, and with the point system, with, what is fun is that it's easy to calculate. Mm -hmm. um, so if you use 
uh, some reaction to do something like, for example, you uh, are playing a time shaman and you use one of your spell to give an ally that is supposed to be hit a bonus to their dodge. Um, with that, you can just say, oh, but I use two points before my turn. So when my turn starts, I have two points so I can do whatever I want, uh, although it, it costs two points. Uh, so it, it gives a lot of freedom and it's also easy to count and calculate um, easier than like standard move free uh, and things like that because uh, we have a lot of people in the team that have uh, ADHD and the usual like standard move and things like that was really complicated for them to comprehend mm -hmm. like I know that not everybody has uh, these issues, but we we said, but if you don't understand or if you have problem understanding that, well, other people probably have this struggle too. So we try to bring forward a mechanic that could help people that have more difficulties with uh, the like standard array of actions that you can do. Um, so with this this point system is easy to. It's easy to count, it's easy to follow. You can just write it on your sheet. So I use two points. Okay, I uh, I put a, I don't know, a check mark in it or I erase them. Uh, so it's something that, uh, I think that it's something that we pretty much like and that also uh, make it easier for people. All right. Um, now give, now, um, Given that, given that, given that, um, would it be, where would, where would you, where would you say combat fa falls when it comes to the leth when it comes to the lethality of, in of encount of encounters? Would you say that it's high, that it's highly lethal where where P where PCs can get can get dropped by by a ba by one bad die roll, or would you would you say that there, would you say that it's a case where pe where it's really easy to be tanky, um, or do you fall somewhere in the middle? Mm, I think that uh, it really depends on uh, like what people like GMs put against their players and the number of players and everything else. But mm -hmm. uh, in a neutral setting, I'd say it'd be somewhere in the middle. Um, there are some. Uh, like people that decide to build their character with a little less HP or things like that. Uh, well, if they get hit by a bad die roll, they have way more chances to die pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, but usually we we tried, even though we, we still want to uh, keep the fun before the balance of things, uh, we really try to still balance a little bit the first level uh, so that no classes and no character could be one hit by an attack uh, or like two hit. We tried to make to put it somewhere in the middle. So uh, if a character take damage, like a character that decide to have absolutely no HP and be very uh, squishy, we really tried to make it like three ish attacks before they they are knocked out. So. Um, so it's not like frustrating for a person to just mm -hmm. come into combat, get one shot, and just do nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this it after after all you're tr you're trying to go with some level of heroics. This isn't um this isn't Warhammer Fantasy where you're where you're um where you're playing the rat catcher and and you're one and you're one hit away from death. Um, not that I have anything against Warhammer. It's just it's just different strokes. Yeah. No, we try to go with a a little a little bit of heroics because uh, like people that become like heroes, they are cool people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's pretty sad when like you start your character, your first level, and like it's your first encounter, and you get one shot and you die, and this is the game for you. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit sad. Um, so we try to at least make it that a first level character would be down in like two or three hits uh so it at least give them a chance of survival if the dm rolls bad uh or rolls too good in its on its side but uh um we still try to to give an opportunity to player to not get one shotted by like the 
worst weapon of the game because it would be sad. Now, I'm pretty, I'm, and I'm now some now somebody ends up getting themselves killed because they decided the Leroy Jenkins the thing. Well, there's no cure for that. Yeah, no. At this point, it, it's it's on you. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now, what do you shoot now? Um. I realize that this kind of th this kind of thing is in flux, especially given the nature of crowdfunding. But what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Are you thinking around four hundred to four fifty? Um, we put ourselves a maximum of six hundred pages, but these number of pages also include the space that the illustrations will take. Mm -hmm. uh, so for Really, the text, text. Um, I think that it could be safe to say that it would be around like four hundred ish pages. Uh, but with all illustrations that we want to put in the book, it's gonna take a lot of place. So we expanded this number to make it like bigger to be sure um, can fit everything and all the text and and all like different uh, options. Mm -hmm. And now you now um, I I see that you're you're already a little you're already a little ways in um and congr congratulations on the progress made so far, um. Now, presume presuming and just to make sure I don't jinx. Presuming that uh, that uh, that the go that the initial goal is met. What would you be shooting for as a release window? Are you thinking fall, or are you are you going to be shooting for um, early twenty twenty two? From what we are expecting, depending on like the whole COVID thing, um, we put ourselves a very big delivery window to be sure uh, make it, it, it. It's easier for us to ship something earlier than to delay. Uh, because it, it's a little, it's more frustrating to delay than chip early. <laughs> um, so we went about like August two twenty two as our maximum mm -hmm. delivery date that we want. Uh, if everything goes as it's supposed to, uh, probably be able to go with like fall two twenty two if. Uh, everything goes as planned, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and that's why that's why I knocked on the that's why I knocked on wood just because I don't want to I don't want to tempt the gods of irony. <laughs> yeah, it it would really depend on like uh, majority the COVID thing because uh, our main artist is in Italy, um, and Italy is weird these days, so. Uh, there's like this old rules of not going out and not doing this or that, and it's really complicated with COVID. So right now, uh, it's something that we have to deal with as a team. So um, it's stuff that happens with the global world situation right now. So that's why we gave ourselves a very big, uh, bigger delivery window that we could have given just to be sure that uh, if... COVID strikes again in some sort of other violent way somewhere. Uh, we're not like uh, set back too much. I'd, ima I'd imagine that time zones also make things interesting. Yeah, <laughs> but it's not uh, it's not that bad, honestly. Uh, usually, uh, he sends like things uh, at five here, and then like in the morning or later. I just review the thing and then it starts working again in the morning in Italy and then send it back uh, like around five. So it's not that bad. Uh, most artists we have are somewhere in the world that is far away from here. Uh, so we are used to deal with uh, time zones and things like that. All right. I got, I got you. Well, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. And yeah, it, it's a pleasure, really. It's fun, uh, and I, I like joining 
people in talk about the game or hear like uh, they hear them like ask question and answer and stuff like that so it's cool mm -hmm. and anytime you see fit to return to the temple the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>